it's always exciting when unexpected connections between different subfields of a science develop. This is, uh, it's often the signal that rapid progress is going on. And I think you've already heard from previous talks that one place where such rapid connection, where new connections are rapidly developing is between quantum information, quantum many body physics, quantum field theory, and quantum gravity. And I think, well, the only prediction I'll make about the next five years is that these connections will continue to grow rapidly. I want to talk today about an aspect of these connections having to do with a kind of quantum chaos that's come to be called scrambling. The work I'll talk about is joint work with Douglas Stanford, who's now a postdoc at the Institute for Advanced Study. There's related work going on at Stanford by Matthew Dottelson and Eva Silverstein. And Alexei Kitev has been thinking about very similar ideas that he'll describe in the following talk. Okay. Well, let me start on the quantum information side to give you some background. Let's talk about a system that's almost always discussed in that context, a set of n qubits. For many reasons, including some very concrete ones, workers in this field are interested in producing a good approximation to a random unitary operator applied on this Hilbert space. Now, a really uniformly good approximation would take an exponentially long time, exponential in n, to, to compute. But it turns out, somewhat surprisingly, that a unitary that's random for many purposes can be made much, much more quickly. And here's an example of an algorithm that does that. Pair each of these qubits with a, another partner at random. Here's a set of pairs. And then to each pair, apply a random unitary operator in that two qubit Hilbert space. That's quick. Then do it again. I've just indicated a couple of the pairs on the second stage. And then do it again. It's clear after log to the base two of n steps, you've at least entangled every qubit with every other. That's why they're all blue here. Okay. What's interesting, and, and it certainly was surprising to me, that after a few sweeps like this, you've produced a, a very good approximation to a random unitary for, for the special purposes that it's constructed for. This time, a time step times log to the base two of n, reformulated in a many body physics language, n would be the entropy. The time step would typically be the thermal time. And so we would have a time beta log s. This is the scrambling time, and it'll be the focus of this talk. Patrick Hayden and John Preskill, who are both here, made the connection between scrambling and the physics of black hole horizons. Yasuhiro Sakino and Lenny Suskind, who's here, made the connection to gauge gravity duality. Both of these groups made the crucial, pointed out the crucial role of exponentially large near horizon redshifts i.e. large relative boosts between an early and a late observer for this process. I'll say more about that in a few minutes. Well, the first task Douglas and I set for ourselves was to give a precise holographic calculation, building on these ideas of chaos at this time scale. To do this, we used a framework uh, introduced by Mark Van Ramskunk, who I guess is not here. Okay. Well, start with a special state in a, theory, in a Hilbert space consisting of two conformal field theories, a left one and a right one. The state has a long history in physics. You sum over all the eigenstates of the right theory, tensor the same eigenstate of the left theory, and weight it by this factor. The state has a lot of nice properties. If you just look on the right, trace out the left, it looks like a thermal density matrix, the same on the left. But the state is quite special. It's not a random state in the full to conformal field theory Hilbert space. It has a lot of special entanglements that we'll talk about at some length. For the right kind of CFT, Juan Maldacena, who's here, taught us that it has a holographic dual, this eternal ADS Schwarzschild black hole that we already saw in Patrick's talk. The right CFT lives here. It looks in on a thermal state described by this black hole. The left CFT looks, it lives here, looking in on its own left-handed black hole and they're joined by a wormhole. The special properties of the state are coded in the fact that there's a rather short wormhole here. We want to diagnose the special entanglements in this state. Well, there are a lot of ways in diagnosing it. One is, goes back to the work of Ryu and Takianagi that is being celebrated today. But we're going to use a much lower brow technique. We're going to consider the correlation function between an operator 
in the right CFT correlated with the same operator in the left. In certain cases, you can compute this correlation function by finding the length of the shortest geodesic connecting these two points. Here's a geodesic connecting these two points. It's short, meaning the wormhole is short. That means the correlation is large. This state is special. Well, now we can ask our chaos question. These conformal field theories have to be chaotic, otherwise they wouldn't produce the thermal behavior of black holes. Let's imagine that we slightly disturb the state. We flap the butterfly's wings and ask, how much does that disturbance propagate in later time? Think of this operator W as that disturbance. Maybe it excites one thermal quantum at a time TW. Here's its holographic image. It's a shock wave, a wave of null radiation propagating in from the boundary, and it's joined by this wave coming out. Now, there's not much curvature in this. If we just excited one thermal quantum, this is quite a mild disturbance of geometry. Now, this black hole has a symmetry. You can move time up on the right boundary and down on the left and, and have the same geometry. It's a boost symmetry much like Lorentz invariance in Minkowski space. The time on the boundaries plays the role of rapidity. So we could take the shock wave state and transform it by the symmetry. Here's moving it down on the left-hand side. The geometry is the same. But if you pick out a fixed reference frame, like the frame of that geodesic on the previous slide, an observer in that frame will see a higher and higher energy pulse of radiation running by him under this boost. The fact that this geodesic sees a higher and higher energy pulse opens the way for the geodesic to be deformed more and more by the shock. The energy that the geodesic observer sees is the characteristic scale, the thermal energy, times this exponential in T. That's because T is, a, um, is, a, is the boost parameter, or rapidity. This should say the time at which this is applied, not T star. Well, then we can ask our chaos question. We can take this correlation function that diagnoses entangle, special entanglements in this shocked state. Well, what happens is this large energy can deform the geodesic. It can stretch it. The wormhole gets longer. The geodesic gets longer. The correlation decreases. This is the holographic signal of chaos. When is this effect going to be appreciable? Is it going to come appreciable at a time t star when this energy in the geodesic reference frame is equal to another characteristic energy, the mass of the black hole? In these kinds of systems, the mass of the black hole over its temperature is the entropy. And so we find that this characteristic time is beta over 2 pi log s. This is the scrambling time as advertised, and this is an argument for it. You can actually plot the curve of this correlation function versus time, and it looks like that. Scrambling is about there when the geodesic, when this curve drops to about a half. But now I want to make some points about this curve that will set up the questions I want to ask in the, in the rest of the talk. The first point is this curve looks very much like the result of some qubit model you would build to model the situation. So it seems like it's getting something right. The second thing is that the correlation doesn't drop to zero at the scrambling time. There is some correlation at much longer times. It's not big, but it's some. And the smallest reasonable value of this correlator, e to the minus the entropy, doesn't happen until a much longer time, a time of order the entropy. Now, past that, there are more interesting things happening, that the ideas of tensor networks and complexity that have already been discussed here uh, are very good diagnostics. But this very lowbrow diagnostic craps out here. We're, uh, we'll be modest in this talk, at least, and talk about times much less than this. OK, well, now this exponential increase of energy coupled with the fact that something seems diagnosable at longer times leads to a puzzle. Suppose we imagine the shock state and this operator phi right applied to it. The operator phi right holographically emits some kind of wave into the bulk, and it bumps into this ultra high energy shock, it makes some kind of collision. The center of mass energy for that collision is given squared is given by this kind of formula. Notice the exponential. And I'll remind you that exponentials grow very quickly. Right. 
At, for instance, two scrambling times, the center of mass energy of this collision is enough to build a black hole equal to the mass of the black hole you started with. At three scrambling times, the wave can only propagate a Planck time past the shock without hitting a singularity. This picture really doesn't do justice to the violence of the processes that are in play. Um, well, roughly speaking, the state that you make is a mess for times large enough. And so this raises the question that we puzzled with for a while. How does this mess not get into calculations of chaos? Okay. And, and the resolution of that puzzle, we think, building on some work of Hoffman and Maldacena, is that what we're computing is not some kind of S matrix for how the wave passes through the shock, but a correlation function. We take the state here, and we're correlating it, take its overlap with a state made by quite a different process, putting a left-handed operator here. If this state is a mess, typically, and this state is quite a different thing, the overlap will be essentially zero. It'll be like e to the minus the entropy. So this will make no contribution to the correlator. But there could be a small part of this state that is not making a mess, and it'll have a much larger overlap. The correlation function is computing the probability amplitude not to make a mess. Okay. Well, when will you not make a mess? This operator phi rate creates some kind of wave function for waves in this bulk. And there's some amplitude, pretty small, for the phi wave to be traveling almost parallel to the shock. Then when the, the wave scatters through the shock, the center of mass energy is very low, or relatively low, and there's not a mess. And that can connect in a finite way to the other state. That's what we think is going on. That's what the correlator is computing. You're fighting the paucity of the amplitude to have these almost parallel momenta with the fact that if you let larger collision energies happen, the correlator shuts off. And when you do that balance, you find a curve just in gravity approximation, like the curve just like the one I sketched. And the characteristic energy of the collision is given by this. Newton's constant times the center of mass energy squared is always order one. I'll pretend I'm in four dimensions for units. but. Uh, Okay. This is a, a high energy, but it's not a murderously high energy as the kind I was moaning about before. It doesn't make messes. It's an energy high enough that Einstein gravity is no longer valid, but in fact, perturbative string theory still, in, in at least for the impact parameters that are characteristic of this process, is still applicable. So this leads to the questions that I, I want to, to raise now. What kind of effects beyond Einstein gravity are visible in this chaotic process? Well, unfortunately, precise tools are kind of thin on the ground in this subject, doing string theory behind black hole horizons and stuff. So we've had to do our best and make heuristic estimates. And we've tried to take the most conservative point of view. We've tried to imagine that as little as possible happens. And these are some of the phenomena that we think will happen. Probably one of the oldest phenomena when people upgraded particles into strings that happens in scattering is that strings spread. When you have high energy collisions of strings, their transverse size grows like the square root of the logarithm of the center of mass energy. Okay. Translated, remember S is e to the t, translated in terms of boundary time, this is a transverse spread that goes like the square root of time. This was noticed many years ago by Lenny and this group as string spreading on the horizon. Here the reflection is in this boundary field theory, there's some diffusive spread of chaos in the boundary theory. If you just kept, did Einstein gravity, you would get a ballistic spread of chaos. This says that there's an accompanying diffusive spread as well. This is not the usual diffusion you see in gauge gravity dualities because it goes to zero when the string length goes to zero or when the Atuf coupling goes to infinity. We're actually puzzled what this means in these boundary field theories. I and mean, it's an interesting question that will be part of our five-year plan to dope this out. Another thing happens when strings scatter at high energies, when you have a string falling through this high energy shock. Sometimes they get excited. The, the oscillator modes of the string can get excited. This is sometimes called tidal excitation, or I think in the old days, which were before my time, it was called diffractive excitation. Okay. 
Well, you can diagnose this. You can imagine that a phi quanta starts from the right. It passes through the shock and turns into something else, an excited string state. So you study a two-point function of a phi and a chi, where a chi is dual to an excited string state. This is a cartoon of what that might look like. Don't pay any attention to the numbers and the axes. This is just a cartoon. There's no calculation here. Well, you'd start off very small, because phi and chi are quite different operators. But then as chaos starts doing its work, the amplitude will increase until finally strong chaos prevails and the result shuts down. Another thing that happens when you do the string scattering is there's some amplitude for all the energy to turn into a very large string, a very long string, which then showers down into a lot of decay products. This probably happens, and we, we haven't really thought through carefully how to diagnose this in the boundary uh, chaotic field theory. But there should be some image of it. Well, the final set of phenomena I want to talk about is one where, in fact, you go far beyond this, this range where perturbative string theory might be accurate, where you really do have to worry about these very high energy collisions. And that's a circumstance where you have two shocks colliding. Here's a, maybe a simple uh, kinematic setup. You have a shock from the left, and you have a shock from the right. That is, you set off chaos in the left CFT here, and set off chaos from the, from the right CFT here, and let them evolve. This looks like a shock wave collision. If these are not applied too early, the center of mass energy is not too high. You might make a few decay products, maybe a few long strings. The geodesic connecting these goes through this region, and so it's sensitive to it, but not much has happened. To, to figure out the course of these geodesics, we've made some gravity approximation. Well, say, what happens if you apply these shocks very early, many scrambling times? Then they collide up here. The Penrose diagram gets distorted. The collision energy is enormous. And sure enough, you make a mess. But the correlation function determined by this geodesic avoids the mess. There's a kind of sequestering. The, the correlation function doesn't know about this strong chaos. But there's an intermediate region where the collision energy is still quite large. It's enough energy to make a, a black hole of mass m up here. And still, the gravity approximation says the geodesic runs right through it. So the geodesic must be sensitive to making long, you know, small black holes that evaporate and decay and do all kinds of things. And so in principle, it seems like this kind of measurement should know something about really non-perturbative string theory here. From the boundary point of view, you have chaos going on here and chaos going on here. The thermal field double state correlates the result of that chaos. And that's reflected in some non-perturbative quantum gravity up here. That, well, we haven't begun to think about signatures, but it seems like a good thing to do. Well, there's lots more to do here. But let me end by just uh, saying that this idea that very long time behavior of black holes is related to very high energy phenomenon near the black hole horizon goes back to the original work of Hawking and Unruh on radiation from black holes. And in that context, it was often called the Transplankian problem. And well, I guess what I want to leave you with is the statement that we should probably rebrand that and call it a transplankian opportunity. All right. That's all I have to say. Thank you. All right, questions for Steve. Yes. Patrick? I, actually, I was just wondering if you could say a little bit more about yep. the case where the, the two shocks come in at a very early time. Yes. Uh, because then, intuitively, I just would have, have expected that the, the wormhole would be sensitive to what happens. But you say it's the exact opposite. Yeah. That, that, that's an interesting situation that um, you really just see. I mean, the, the correlator will be very small, but it will just be the, the sum of the uh, decorrelating effects of this shock and this shock, which again are determined by collisions, energies that are of this G Newton S of order one size. Okay, somehow the uh, and so the correlator will be small, but it won't. There won't be a correlated effect. You know, roughly the geodesic will not be the sum of the lengthening due to this shock and the lengthening due to this shock, 
But whereas in the other circumstance where it passes through here, there's some interaction effect. The length is not just the sum of this and this. If you just work in gravity approximation, not surprisingly, it looks like the geodesic is a little longer than the sum of these two. There's some enhancement of having both left and right chaos going on that, that causes a, a more rapid decorrelation. But if you go to this situation, the, the, the chaos, although it shuts this thing down pretty well, it's just the sum of this plus this. So this interaction seems to be a time-limited phenomenon. And I, I don't have anything more to say about that other than that's what the result says. Yeah. Any? Uh, I have a very quick technical question. Sure. If you go back to one slide, I think it's one slide, yeah. This no, one? no, there. Uh, what happens to the code dimension one surface? That's there? a very good question. Oh, we, we're, sure. we're, we don't know yet. Okay. The, 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 the question, I'll, I mean, the, the reason it's especially interesting is let's work in this uh, Goldilocks regime. Okay, suppose the code dimension one, the complexity surface went through there. The reasons, I think, following your ideas, we would say that the complexity should be exactly the sum of the complexity here plus the complexity here, because the Hamiltonians run independently. If there is, if the complexity surface ran through here, it says the length might have some interaction effect. Yeah. But okay. There is a mechanism to repel it out of that. Region. There is. It's diff it's absolutely because of, well, for reasons you know very well. So it's possible that the complexity surface doesn't run through here. So, so this becomes an interesting test of, uh, of a, a more refined test, I would say, of, of the complexity conjecture. It allows the chance of interactions. All right, in view of the time, I think we're going to have to thank Steve again. <laughs> <laughs>